So today we're going to talk about whether or not fasting is a good or bad idea right now. We're going to talk about mTOR. We're going to talk about inhibiting mTOR and how mTOR inhibition, which can occur through fasting, how that affects the immune system. I'll share with you some results of some clinical studies in elderly subjects taking the drug rapamycin, which as many of you know, rapamycin essentially is putting the brakes on mTOR, which thereby is increasing autophagy and some surprising findings when it comes to affecting the immune system in a favorable manner. We're gonna talk about how intermittent fasting suppresses chronic inflammation. And as many of you have been following some of the you know, disease mortality and some of the, the death uh, statistics and so forth from this novel human coronavirus in Southern states where obesity and chronic disease prevalence is much higher, these individuals have a much higher prevalence of increased disease severity, probably due to their uh, chronic inflammation and other metabolic abnormalities. And then talk about the drug chloroquine. So the drug chloroquine actually affects the lysosome, which is part of the autophagy process. So we're gonna unpack autophagy and discuss whether or not autophagy is a good or bad idea to increase or decrease right now. So that's where we're going. I wanna welcome you back. I'm Mike Mutzel. You're watching High Intensity Health. I can't directly see you, but I can see your likes and your comments. So if you're enjoying this comment, or this content, please hit that like button. Leave a comment below. I will be following your comments. I like to reply to as many as I can. And the studies that we're talking about today, including the, the mechanism of action about how chloroquine works, uh, its lysosomotropic properties, and much more, links are below. And also, this video is brought to you by our very own courses.highintensityhealth.com where we have a range of do-it-yourself courses that are self-paced to teach you how to improve your health on, and metabolic flexibility on a range of different levels and topics. If you wanna master the art and science of eating just one meal per day and compressing that feeding window without losing muscle mass and improving your energy, skin health, and much more, links are below. And so let's just dive right into it. What do we know? First of all, the question that you have is, is fasting good or bad right now? Am I gonna improve my health and resiliency and maybe uh, improve my immune system or affect my immune system in a negative way and have some unintended you know, health consequences? Well, here's what we know. We know that good old fashioned garden variety, intermittent fasting affects the immune system in a favorable manner, namely by reducing chronic inflammation. And as I mentioned, the CDC has published some data showing that individuals that have diseases that are characterized with chronic inflammation tend to not do so well if they're infected with this novel human coronavirus. So it makes sense that if nothing else, just compressing your feeding pattern, that is by you know fasting for a longer window of the day than you are eating, is going to improve your body. We also know from some research back in, uh, I think this was September or actually June of 2019, um, showed that intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding, eating in an eight-hour window between, I think it was eight and two, or 10 and two, something like that, uh, decreased mTOR, it affected AMPK, which is affecting all these intracellular processes of autophagy. So that's what we know. So garden variety, intermittent fasting, probably very beneficial. Is prolonged fasting gonna be, you know, add some therapeutic benefits? Probably not, depending upon your disease process. This is where I don't think it's really helpful because of some of the data that have shown that, you know, chronic energy restriction does negatively affect the immune system. So now you might be saying, well, Mike, doesn't, you know, prolonged fasting affect autophagy? Well, here's where the waters get a little muddy. And the drug chloroquine, which has been recently, I think, approved by the FDA to, you know, at least, you know, a lot of people are using this off-label drug that is classically used as an anti-malarial compound to treat COVID-19. It's been used in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, it's been used, I think, for 50 years for uh, malaria. Well, it seems that the... <clears throat> The mechanism of action through which how this drug works is it affects the lysosomes. Now, some of you might have heard of the lysosome. You're like, well, that sounds familiar. Well, in the process of autophagy, and we've done many other videos about autophagy. I'm not going to talk about that now, but to make a long story short, a lot of people confuse about, you know, and, and mis, you know, characterize what autophagy is. Autophagy is an intracellular phenomenon. It's not this Pac-Man-like thing where cells are eating other cells. Okay, that's called phagocytosis. Do not confuse phagocytosis with autophagy. Okay, well, in the process of autophagy, we have this, all these initiation proteins and, and so forth cause the formation of this autophagosome, which fuses with this lysosome, which is really doing the heavy lifting when it comes to autophagy, although autophagy gets all the notoriety. The lysosome is this bag of enzymes, over 50 enzymes and hydrolases and so forth that just chew things up. Well, it seems that this human coronavirus and other RNA, positive RNA viruses, leverage the autophagosome, or I'm sorry, more so the, the lysosome to improve their ability to, to kind of spread uh, and increase their viral load. 
So this is where the drug chloroquine comes in. I'll throw up some images so you can see here. It's really kind of, it's called a uh, lysosomotropic. It's affecting the lysosome function and can prevent that virus from replicating. So then you might think, okay, well, then prolonged fasting, whereby we would actually increase lysosome formation and the autophagosome process and really ramp this up. Is that a good thing? Well, you don't really know unless you're for sure you're negative for coronavirus, right? So that's the thing is we, we don't have enough testing. We don't have antibody testing. Not everyone's being tested. You know, uh, different, you know, Abbott's trying to release this test very quickly. That's real time, two minute, you know, uh, results. So we don't know. So erring on the side of safety, I'm not recommending prolonged fast right now because we don't want to, you know, add fuel to the fire, right? Should you be infected? Because the latency of being, you know, people that can be exposed to this don't develop symptoms for, for it can be up to, you know, 10 days. Uh, some reports even hint at 14 days, the latency. So uh, don't, you know, add kerosene to, a, to the fire or add fuel to the fire. So that's what I'm suggesting. Now, what I do is I do a every Monday I fast for, I just don't eat any food. Okay, I call it Metabolic Monday. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter if you call it Metabolic Monday. But I've just found that Monday's a great day to kind of hit the reset button. On the weekends, I like to have a little red wine, sometimes a kombucha beer. Sometimes I'll have some sweet potato fries my wife makes in the oven. So, uh, you know, I, I practice and implement the 80-20 principle. You know, I'm not getting, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, but I, I do eat a little bit. I, I open up the restrictions and unleash some of those restrictions on the weekends. And then Metabolic Monday is kind of a reset. So that's what I'm doing, you know, but I don't have cardiometabolic disease risk factors. I'm not overweight. So you need to figure out maybe you do a metabolic Monday and then you fast on Thursday, right? So you're doing like two, two 24 hour fasts in a week. So come up with something based upon what your health goals are, what your prior metabolic history is. And again, just to plug our autophagy enhancer masterclass and our, our flexible OMAD e course, we help you figure out based upon your health history, your lab work, your metabolic flexibility history what the a fasting protocol should be based upon where you're at. Everyone's on a different wavelength, and so we want to kind of figure that out. So let's finish up now with rapamycin treatment in elderly subjects and talk about immunosenescence. So this is the age-related decline in immune function that can lead to morbidity and mortality in elderly subjects and also increase their susceptibility to infections. And you might know that in, from the CDC and some of the data that's being published when it comes to the outcomes of individuals that are infected with the coronavirus, after the age of 65, there's a huge increase in the, you know, kind of mortality, right? So yeah, there's an age element, but there's also the comorbidity element as well that's playing into that. And so what these scientists have figured out, there's been two, two studies to my knowledge, and I'll link them up and pop them up right here so you can see, using rapamycin, which inhibits mTOR. When mTOR is inhibited, mechanistic target of rapamycin is what the acronym mTOR stands for, we have the process of autophagy is increasing. Now, you might think at first, well, how does that affect the immune system? Because we've been taught that mTOR plays a pro-growth process and it might affect the immune system in a favorable manner, but it seems that as we get older, our autophagy machinery get a little rusty and the levels, we need a little bit more stimulation. So that's another thing to think about. Should you be fasting a lot? Well, if you're 21 years old, I don't recommend a lot of prolonged fasting unless you are morbidly obese and have a lot of cardiometabolic risk factors and metabolic issues. But if you're, if you're 81 years old, that's a different story. Okay, so what these scientists did is they, one study had over 216 individuals, the other one had 25 individuals. And what they specifically wanted to do is look at how giving rapamycin, the mTOR inhibitor, which would accelerate autophagy and also ameliorate immunosenescence. I'm not going to get into that now because it's a long conversation, but the age-related decrease in immune function is what can lead to age-related chronic diseases and increased susceptibility to various age-related diseases, including infectious diseases, right? So these scientists wanted to see if they were given these individuals over the age of 65 very low doses of rapamycin, again, the mTOR inhibitor, which would increase autophagy, how it would affect their immune system. And to make a very long story short, the results were positive. They injected these individuals with a flu shot for influenza and found that their antibody titers were much higher compared to the control group, meaning that when mTOR was inhibited, it had this ability to sort of for lack of a better word, regenerate the immune system and make the immune system a little bit more resilient. And also, uh, another study showed that the CD4 and CD8 T helper cells had decreased markers of this PD1, which is a, a marker of cellular senescence. So essentially, inhibiting mTOR 
has a favorable effect on the immune system. So now that you know that, we know that one way that we can inhibit mTOR, a clinical study out of Alabama earlier this year showed that regular time-restricted feeding was able to actually reduce mTOR and po possibly, potentially, they didn't look at immunological biomarkers in the study. Uh, but, but again, you don't need to do a prolonged fast to get some of the benefits in this cellular machinery. Again, so to make a long story short, if you're metabolically inflexible and have increased cardiometabolic risk factors and body composition and so forth issues, I would start time-restricted feeding right now, okay? So whatever your feeding fasting window is, you know, based upon your sleep-wake cycle, whatever that is, uh, start at minimum of 14 hours fasting, preferably a 16-8. Be consistent when you break your fast and start your fast as that will affect your sleep and your other body's uh, biological functions. Exercise, particularly in a fasted state, might be helpful. And if you really want to push the needle, maybe you can do a 36-hour fast once or twice a week. But I'm not advising any prolonged fasts uh, for individuals unless there's you know extraneous circumstances, a lot of health issues going on there. Uh, because potentially increasing autophagy if you are exposed to this virus may not be a good thing. Now, of course, data with well, time will only tell. We don't know. We don't have any human studies. And I'm not your doctor. You need to work with your health practitioner. You need to, I don't know your blood work. I don't know your prior health history and so forth. So uh, just wanted to share this video. If you found this helpful, I know we rattled off some complex words in biochemistry and jargon, but uh, if you want to learn more about enhancing autophagy in your own life, how to master the art and practical way to eat one meal a day, links are below to our OMAD course. And we have a lot of great bundles going on right now to help people out during this really challenging time. So I appreciate you for watching all the way through. I know this was a lot here, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll catch you on a future episode down the road. Until then, have a good day. Bye now.